It's so very good for us to be here today. We want to welcome our visitors. We're glad that you've taken time to assemble with us, and we hope that you will stay for our Bible class afterwards. We want to uh, focus this day on rejoicing and worshiping God. We had a good weekend this weekend. Robert and Rachel joined in the covenant of marriage. Everything went very well. The congregation worked very hard in in making that possible, arranging things here at the building. So we have very much to be thankful about. And I think it's good for us as a congregation to just pause and worship God and realize that we're here to assemble together to worship God and to glorify His name. And there's not a better psalm to talk about this than Psalm 100. In fact, all 150 psalms of the Old Testament are basically an inspired hymn book. It's inspired Hebrew poetry in which we derive some of our own songs that we sing in our worship. And they were songs that were sung under the Old Testament arrangement of things. Psalm 100 is one of those beautiful psalms, and we're going to look at every verse in this as we consider worshiping and praising God this uh, very morning and tonight as well. Psalm 100 and verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Do you notice the enthusiasm that's there? Do you notice that in our English there's an explanation point there? That's denoting passion. That's denoting zeal. That's denoting excitement. And brethren, we can be excited and zealous in praising God properly. We don't have to go off on a tangent to be excited and zealous about doing God's will. And therefore, we see that this praise is something that is done by the psalmist here, making a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Notice he is calling upon all nations to worship him. Not just the Jewish people, but all nations. Christians are to be a people of passionate praise. I want you to look at Psalm 86 and verse 12 as we consider this. Psalm 86, verse 12 and 13. Psalm 86, verse 12 and verse 13 And think about this when it comes to our worship. When we worship as a church, when we worship with individual, as individuals, as Christians. Psalm 86, verse 12, or 11, uh, uh, 12 and uh, 13. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all of my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Notice what David says here. He says, I'm going to give thanks to God. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on, how that we are to have a heart that's full of gratitude. I will give thanks to God. And notice he says, with all of my heart, or with my whole heart, I'm going to do this. This is wholehearted worship unto God. God wants all of our heart. And he says, I will glorify your name forever. Why? What's the motivation? Why do that? Verse 13, for great is is your steadfast love toward me. And you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. David here is praising God and he's going to do it with his whole heart. And notice what he says. He's going to do it with his whole heart And the reason is because of God's steadfast love towards us. Now you think about that when it comes to David and how much more we should praise God based upon us fully realizing the plan of salvation that's found in the New Testament. We have the completed revelation of God. David only had part of it. It was just given to him in promise. We have the reality of it. And so because we see Him fully manifest in the death of Jesus Christ, His steadfast love towards us, how much more we should be a people of passionate praise towards God. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, Jesus talked to the woman at the well. John chapter 4, verse 24 and, uh, 23 and 24. 
He says when they're talking about worship. He says in verse 23, The hour is coming and now is that the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The hour is coming, Jesus is saying. It's talking about the coming of the new covenant age in which we now live. When the true worshipers, that's what we should consider ourselves as, as Christians. True worshipers who worship the Father in spirit and in truth because God is seeking such to worship Him. And it must be from our whole heart. It must be out of a total heart of love and dedication and gratitude. Because God is spirit and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That means it's from our heart. It's from our whole heart. It's from our innermost being that we worship and praise God. And it's according to truth. It's according to His will. We must do things what, as He has commanded, as He has instructed in His will. But we don't have to do it in a cold formalism. We can do it with passion. We can do it with zeal. And therefore, that's why Titus tells us, Titus chapter 2, that we are to be a people of passion when it comes to good works and worshiping God. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, Christ gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. So we have been purified by the death of Christ, and we are His own special people, that's the church, and we are to be zealous, that means to be excited, to be passionate about good works. And that would include our worship. That is a good work. So we see here the passion of worship as we passionately worship God according to His will. Psalm 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with thanksgiving. Coming before God with a glad heart, with rejoicing, and coming in His presence with singing. Christians serve with joy. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul writing in deplorable conditions, says rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know, if anyone had had an occasion to complain, it would have been Paul. He's writing from prison. He could have wrote to the brethren and said, "My, my conditions are horrible. My rights are being violated. But he didn't say that. He said rejoice in the Lord always. The most upbeat and optimistic book In the New Testament is the book of Philippians. And it was written by Paul in deplorable, horrible conditions as he was a prisoner of the Roman Empire for doing nothing wrong, but for doing everything right. We are to be a people of praise and rejoicing. We serve the Lord with gladness. We serve Him with rejoicing. And we come before His presence with singing. We sing to honor God and to build each other up. Ephesians in the New Testament, Ephesians as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Paul tells the church, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You be under the control of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that before. When we submit to the Spirit's Word in the Scriptures, we are filled with the Spirit. We are being guided by the Holy Spirit. And what do you do as worship? Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. See, it's in your heart you make this praise and worship unto God with your whole heart, with a heart of dedication. So we serve Him all week. Then we assemble together upon the first day of the week as we're doing today to worship Him. To, to show our gratitude. We come before His presence and we not only praise Him in our songs, but in the songs that we sing, it says to speak to one another in these things. In other words, when we're singing to, to, together congregationally, we're listening to the Word, we're listening to the message, we're actually, actually confessing our faith. We're teaching one another. In fact, that's exactly what Colossians says. Colossians chapter 3. 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, as he writes to the church at Colossae, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Did you notice Paul twice talked about the heart? With your heart. That's not just singing because it's our habit, that's just what we do. We sing, we take the message, we make it our own, and we express it out in our singing. This is done, of course, congregationally. When, song, when, when, when places have uh, choirs and quartets and solos, they're violating the clear pattern that we find here in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, Colossians 3 and verse 16, and it turns worship into a talent show. And worship is not to be a talent show. Worship is to be worshiping God in which no one has the spotlight on them, not even the song leader. But everyone blending their voices together as a congregation in which we praise God. And it doesn't matter how you sound. We should, of course, try to sound the best we can as we're worshiping God. But it's not a matter of, well, I don't have a beautiful voice, therefore I will not sing. You know, God has never demanded us to sing to Him with a beautiful voice. He says to sing. And we can all do that. And therefore, it sounds precious to God because that is His will and He wants us to do it. So we serve the Lord in our life when we come before His presence with singing. Psalm 100. Psalm 100 and verse 3. Know that the Lord, Yahweh, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Notice that the psalmist here is putting the spotlight and the focus on God. It is the Lord. It is Yahweh who made us. It is the one true God of Israel who made all of mankind. There's some interesting movies out that talk about Greek mythology and you have various gods and such. And that's fun to watch and that, that's interesting. But we have to understand that's mythology. There's only one true God. It's not Zeus. One true God. It is Yahweh, the God of Israel. It is He who made us. He is God. He's the only one in His category. If you see a chart up here, if we could make a chart sometime, and we can put a chart in which there's deity... And then there's creation. There, there's the creator and then there's creation. The only one that would be in the category of creator is God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Everything else would fall into the category of creation. And therefore it is God who created. He made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. God owns us by right of creation and redemption. He owns us. We are His. We are stewards of this life. That's why these lessons on Sunday night are very important for us to, come, to understand that all that we have, we are stewards of, which we understand that we are to give to God sacrificially. God owns us by right of creation and redemption. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. God created the human race. He did not evolve the human race. He created the human race. In His own image, male and female, He created them. And therefore, we belong to God by right of creation. And He is our lead. He is our guide. If you look at Psalm 23, a very well-known psalm. Psalm 23 has many lessons found in those short six verses. Psalm 23, David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. See, we need a leader. We need guidance. And God is willing to be that guide. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table, verse 5, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, if we follow God as our shepherd, we will wind up where He is in heaven. 
We have to follow Him. And notice, as we follow Him, He's going to lead us into nothing but good. Nothing but blessings. Even though we go through the hard times and difficult times, as every human will. Verse 4 says, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, and I will fear no evil. Even in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. That refers to all the blessings that's poured out on us. On our head, in our cup, symbolically speaking, it's overflowing all the blessings that we have. And notice verse 6 of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So we have the Lord as our shepherd before us. We're following Him and we're leaving a trail of goodness and mercy behind us. Nothing but good comes from doing God's will. And when we follow Him, then eventually we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are His sheep. As Israel of old where it was God's sheep, God's uh, fold, we, the church, we are the shepherd, we are the sheep, we are the fold of the great shepherd. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, we see Jesus taking this imagery of the Old Testament concept of the sheep-shepherd relationship and applying it to Himself and His followers. John chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. Jesus says, The thief comes, uh, uh, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that we may have life, that they may have life, and have it more abundantly. That's that overflowing life. That cup that overflows. Then in verse 11 he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He was willing to give his life for the sheep so the sheep could have everlasting life. Now drop down to verse 27 through 30 of John chapter 10. My sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So we see here that the sheep that will benefit from all the blessings the shepherd is willing to give that we read about in Psalm 23 are sheep that are willing to listen to hear the voice of the shepherd and follow. That's obedience. That's obedient faith. The ones that do that throughout their life will have eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will be able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So God is our creator. He owns us by right of creation. And God is our redeemer. He owns us by right of redemption. We are His people because of the redemption that He purchased on the cross. Psalm 100 in verse 4. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. Notice here the attitude again, entering into His gates. That's referring to the gateway of the temple, the temple courtyard. You go into the temple in the Old Testament, you would enter into a gate. And therefore you would be in the temple courtyard. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. There's that attitude of being thankful. And into His courts with praise. And you have, once again, a thankful attitude. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. We should have an attitude of gratitude in everything that we do as we worship and serve God. Philippians chapter 4, again, uh, one of the most optimistic books of the New Testament. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, writing again, in deplorable conditions, he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Being thankful. If we have this heart of gratitude, it will be expressed in our worship. We will be here. We will want to be here. We will take the time to be here. 
and we will worship God. And not only as we assemble together with the church, as Hebrews 10, 25 exhorts us to do, but also every day of our life, we will take time to worship God because prayer is worship. And therefore, we should be praying without ceasing, as Paul says, every day. We should take time to pray. And that's worship unto God. And therefore, we are expressing our gratitude and our thankfulness towards God as we worship Him. And then finally, the last verse, Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. Why do we give thanks? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations. That's why. That's why. Because the Lord deserves it. He is good. He is the most good there is. You don't get any gooder than God, to use poor English. And because He is so good, therefore we are to worship Him. In His goodness, He has provided mercy and everlasting life. And His truth endures to all generations. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away in Matthew chapter 24. So we see here that truth and mercy are connected to one another. You can't have mercy without truth. And if you believe and obey the truth, you will have mercy. You will have forgiveness. You will have salvation. God's truth reveals His mercy and His goodness towards us. Look at this truth. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, as Paul talks about the blessings of being in Christ, how in verse 3 he talks about all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Ephesians 1, verses 7 through 9, Paul goes on to say, In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself. So we see here, in Christ we have redemption through the blood that was shed on the cross. And through that blood we have forgiveness of sins. That word forgiveness means to be released. Released from bondage. According to the riches of His grace. He's made this to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. There's that overflow of blessing. And therefore, God has provided salvation. And because He is good, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. So if you are a Christian and you're walking in the light, you have this promise of this truth that's found, that's supposed to be 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, in verse 7. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Here is the blessed privilege of being a faithful Christian. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the blessed privilege of being a child of God. And that truth should motivate us and make us feel an attitude of gratitude in which we will worship God in spirit and in truth. If you're a child of God and you're not faithful to the Lord, you need to start walking in the light. You need to repent and come back to the Lord, confessing your sins. Then once again, the blood of Christ will cleanse you. You'll be a faithful child of God once again. Roman, excuse me, Acts chapter 8, verses 22 through 24 tells us what a, an unfaithful child of God has to do when they sin after they're baptized. They have to repent, turn from their sins, and pray for forgiveness. 
And if the sin is public in nature and it brings reproach upon the church, it needs to be repented of publicly. If it's private, it's secret, no one knows about it, it's between you and God. But if it brings reproach upon the church, that's sin against the church. And therefore, it must be confessed publicly. If you're not a child of God, you have another opportunity by God's grace and mercy to become one. And therefore, we see that God's goodness has allowed you to live to this very moment so that you could believe and obey the gospel. Believe in Christ. Confess He is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. If you already believe in Christ and you're willing to confess Him, if you already have repented of your sins, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22 and verse 16. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.